Hello guys, it's Revolution, back for the second part of What If Goku Landed on Planet Krypton. Very positive feedback on part one of this series. I'll continue it as long as it has that popular demand. If you haven't seen part one of this series yet, I highly recommend you do so. Pause this video, go watch part one, then come back to this video. They will be progressing in chronological order and things are about to heat up in part two. But before we begin, if you haven't subscribed to Revolution or you're new to the channel, do hit that subscribe button and the bell button next to it to be notified whenever I release new content, including the follow up to this series, part three. All my socials, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram are all in the information section as well as the pinned comment for all your trolling needs and do keep lending the die shank and your energy. Keep smashing that like button. You'll continue to support is truly appreciated. So if you haven't seen part one and you do want to do so, pause this video now because this part will contain spoilers. Just going to do a little overview of what happened in part one. Obviously, Goku lands on Krypton rather than Earth. Planet Krypton is situated in Universe 7, 27.1 light years away from planet Earth. Goku is raised in the house of El a few years before the birth of Kal-El and the destruction of planet Krypton. He is eventually abducted and used as a weapon by General Zod. He is imprisoned in the Phantom Zone along with General Zod. Planet Krypton on self-destructs. Kal-El is sent to Earth, the Earth from Dragon Ball Universe 7, not DC, where he is raised on a farm by Farmer with a shotgun. Upon realizing his powers years later, he overthrows King Piccolo and the Red Ribbon Army. In this time, he would learn how to utilize Ki, so essentially Superman with Ki. He would then see off Raditz with the help of Piccolo Jr. And then Goku and General Zod would arrive on Earth, where there would be an encounter between General Zod, Goku, known as Kakel, and Kal-El. During this fight, Superman would free Goku from his bondage towards Zod. Goku would turn against Zod and fight with Superman and defeat Zod, sacrificing himself to do so. But this sacrifice would allow him to be sent to King Kai's planet in order to train for the oncoming threat of the Saiyans, while Superman went in search of the Dragon Balls. So after this battle in early age 762, Goku begins his trip on Snake Way, but remember, this Goku is a lot stronger than the previous iteration of Goku from the main timeline, so he gets past Snake Way far quicker than he did in the main timeline. In the meantime, back on Earth, in the Mortal Universe, Superman goes in search of the Seven Dragon Balls. Knowing the God of Earth, Kami, Kami directs him to a woman who has a device that can track the location of these Dragon Balls, and she goes by the name of Bulma. Kal-El proceeds to visit Bulma at the Capsule Corporation and asks her to be able to use one of these devices. Bulma agrees to let him use a Dragon Radar on one condition, that she can go with him. Bulma is attracted to Kal-El. Kal-El agrees to take Bulma with him if it means getting the Dragon Radar to find the Dragon Balls to revive Goku for the oncoming threat of the Saiyans. Kal-El and Bulma would find the first three Dragon Balls with relative ease, but the fourth Dragon Ball they would eventually arrive at Grandpa Gohan's house who still possesses the four-star Dragon Ball. Of course, his name really isn't Grandpa Gohan because this is not the main timeline. He hasn't raised Goku as a child. He is basically Gohan and he hasn't been killed either because once again, he didn't raise Goku as a child. He wasn't killed by Goku turning into an Uzaru. Grandpa Gohan will give the Dragon Ball over to Kal-El, but he requests one thing of Kal-El and that is a martial arts match. If Kal-El can prove himself during the martial arts match, then Grandpa Gohan will give the Dragon Ball to Superman. Kal-El agrees, but little does Kal-El know that Gohan's intention is to test Kal-El's spirit to see if Kal-El has a pure heart. Meanwhile, in Otherworld, after traversing Snake Way, Goku arrives on King Kai's planet. After successfully making King Kai laugh, King Kai agrees to train Goku. Goku, of course, trains on King Kai's planet, which has a gravitational pull 10 times that of Earth. Goku quickly becomes stronger, but remember, this is not the same Goku in the main timeline. He wasn't raised on Earth, he didn't bang his head, he didn't lose all of his memories, and he didn't attain a completely pure heart. However, this Goku is kind due to his experiences on planet Krypton and being raised in the house of El by Jor El and Lara. Remembering them extremely fondly, he misses them dearly. King Kai senses this in Goku and decides to focus on that. Unfortunately, though, this means Goku cannot learn to use the Genki Dharma. Due to his years of torment under General Zod and being used as a literal living weapon, Goku does still have some malice in his heart. However, King Kai does teach Goku the Kaioken technique, a technique that Goku can use in an instant that can multiply all of Goku's combat abilities. Back on Earth, despite Gohan's tender old age, 
he somewhat surprises Kalel with his reflexes and his martial arts ability. Of course, Kalel with his Kryptonian powers, as well as being able to utilize Ki himself in the Dragon Ball world, soundly defeats Gohan, but Gohan senses through Kalel's fighting ability that Kalel has a pure heart and agrees to give him the Dragon Ball. However, he tells Kalel to visit an old master of his so he can be taught a secret technique. Kalel agrees to spike Bulma's protests, but ultimately she goes with him to visit Master Roshi. Somewhere else on Earth, Piccolo Jr. also happens to be training in preparation for the oncoming Saiyans. However, one day whilst Piccolo was training, he starts to note a distortion happening in a close by area. Piccolo monitored this distortion for days, but he couldn't help sense that something dangerous was going to come of this distortion. And Piccolo's instincts were right. One day whilst training, an entity came out of this distortion, breaking through some sort of dimensional wall. This entity, this creature, was a humanoid figure. It was truly monstrous to look at, and he seemed to be having bones protruding from his body. Piccolo sensed immediate danger, though he couldn't quite sense a key signature. He went over to approach this being, but before Piccolo knew it, this creature, this entity, this beast, fired one of its sharp, bony protrusions from his body straight through the chest of Piccolo. Piccolo was rocked, he knew he had to fight back, so he sent some key blasts back at this creature. But this creature just seemed to walk straight through them. He grabbed Piccolo by his torso and his wrist and effortlessly tore Piccolo's arm from his body. He ripped Piccolo's arm off. This creature grabbed Piccolo by his neck. Piccolo felt his key draining. It seemed like this being was absorbing his power. Just as Piccolo felt his life slipping, this creature seemed to be pulled into some sort of vortex that ultimately sent him back into the distortion, back into this other world which he came from. Piccolo, grateful for his life, regenerated his arm and his body and set out to find out exactly what this being was. He had never encountered something so strong. The first thing he thought about was Kal-El, Superman, being extremely strong due to his biology, his, but not necessarily having an extremely high key level. During this time, Kal-El was on an island, training under the guidance of Master Roshi, learning the technique that Gohan suggested he learned to help him in the future against any enemy. While Kal-El was quite an adept key user, he struggled to learn this special technique at first, but he didn't just have the help of Master Roshi, he had the help of Master Roshi's other student, longtime student, Krillin. But eventually, after a month, he managed to master this technique. That technique was called the Kamehameha. Superman had the Kamehameha at his disposal. And in order to prove that he knew this technique to Master Roshi, he had to fire it across the ocean. And this was when Piccolo picked up on Superman's key signature and found his way to Superman to inquire about this beast that had literally brutalized him. It was months away from the date that Raditz told Superman during their initial battle that the Saiyans would arrive on Earth and of course Raditz would be with them himself as he wasn't killed during this battle against Superman and Piccolo Jr. Superman knew that the Saiyans would be arriving soon but Piccolo assured him that this danger may have even surpassed the danger of these oncoming Saiyans. Kal-El agreed to go with Piccolo in order to investigate this creature that had come out of this. Krillin offered to go and find the rest of the Dragon Balls with Bulma to Bulma's displeasure. She was falling hard for Superman, but she agreed to go anyway if it helped aid the man she loved. Superman and Piccolo spent weeks investigating, scouring the earth for clues. They ultimately had no leads, but on the news, there was multiple reports of mass killings by a beast that simply appeared then disappeared. A month had passed, kal was becoming concerned because the date of the arrival of the Saiyans was fast approaching. They were both losing hope, but Piccolo especially had found a newfound respect for kal -El. Seeing him in action, seeing how he worked, how he lived, was starting to inspire Piccolo, but eventually luck would be on their side. They found a distortion and waited it out until something came out of this distortion and eventually the beast came out. It was the same beast that had ripped Piccolo's arm off. Both Piccolo and Kal-El decided to fight it two on one, but they were to no avail. Kal-El used his Kamehameha on this beast, and whilst it was able to hold him off, it simply wasn't enough. This beast just kept walking and taking shots and somehow getting stronger each time he'd taken a blow. 
This beast seemed to be extremely aggressive, especially towards Superman. Far more aggressive against Superman than he was against Piccolo. And that's saying something considering he was pretty aggressive against Piccolo. Kal-El and Piccolo tried aerial attacks as it appeared that this beast couldn't fly. This strategy seemed to be working at first, but eventually this beast started to leap miles at a time, catching Superman and Piccolo, once again ripping off Piccolo's arms. This beast once again took out Piccolo with relative ease. Superman, however, put up a much better fight, but this fight would go on for hours. Eventually, Superman would start to lose. This beast just simply didn't tire. It was relentless and eventually it used one of its protruding bones from its body and stabbed Superman. And just as it was going for the killer blow, Piccolo sacrificed himself and jumped in the way of this beast's attack on Superman. Kal-El was flabbergasted, but just at this moment, distortion started to pull this creature back into the dimension it came from. Piccolo would die in Superman's arms, and Kal-El promised Piccolo that he would revive him with the Dragon Balls just before he passed away. Superman would then go to the Fortress of Solitude and hope that his father, the consciousness of his father, Jor-El, that was present in the Fortress of Solitude, could bear some light on what exactly this creature was. Kal-El explained the situation at hand to his father, the consciousness of Jor-El. He told Jor-El about the Saiyans, and upon the description of the Saiyans, Jor-El knew that this being that Superman intended to revive, that was currently training on King Kai's planet, was Kakel, the Saiyan child that him and his wife raised before Superman was born and was eventually abducted by General Zod. He didn't know much about the Saiyan race itself, however, he did know that when this child was growing up, that it got stronger the more it fought, his body seemed to adapt towards fighting, very similar to the beast that Superman and Piccolo had just fought against. But this beast was not a Saiyan, it was something else entirely, in fact, it was Kryptonian, and it went by the name of Doomsday. Essentially, Doomsday was trapped in the Phantom Zone, Jor-El told Kal-El about the Phantom Zone portal in the Fortress of Solitude. Superman checked out this portal and recognised that this portal was ultimately getting weaker and weaker. It was about to shatter. The dimensional boundaries of this zone was ultimately weakened years ago when General Zod used the power of Kakel to escape it. However, Jor-El told Kal-El to focus on the main threat that was oncoming and that was the Saiyans that were arriving. Superman returned to Master Roche's house in order to wish Goku back to life. He did want to wish Piccolo back, but he knew that in order to tackle this oncoming threat of not just the Saiyans, but Doomsday eventually as well, that he would need the Saiyans combat abilities in order to fend off these threats. So he went to wish Goku back, but King Kai, but King Kai telepathically contacted Kal-El and told him not to wish Goku back to life just yet. He still had a bit more training to do. He told him to wish him back as soon as he realised the Saiyans had arrived on Earth. He promised Superman that he would be able to get Goku to return instantaneously upon having his life brought back to him. He would ultimately teach Goku instant transmission. Whilst Goku didn't learn instant transmission from King Kai in the main timeline, he learnt it from the Yordras. King Kai could have taught Goku but simply forgot to teach Goku this technique but King Kai does know the instant transmission technique and he teaches it to Goku here so he can return to Earth in order to fight the Saiyans. Anyway, Superman would go and train with Krillin for the next month until the Saiyans would arrive and eventually they did. Nappa, Vegeta and Raditz would all arrive on Earth in their space pod. They would go on a rampage destroying cities. After having a bit of fun, Vegeta would declare that they would need to find this Kryptonian that fought off Raditz and he would put on a power scouter. But at that very moment, a distortion started to happen nearby. And out of that distortion would break Doomsday. Doomsday went on a rampage and ultimately started to attack the Saiyans. Vegeta demanded that Raditz fight Doomsday because he ultimately embarrassed them by losing on Earth, initially to Superman and Piccolo. Raditz checked Doomsday's power level on his power scouter, but Doomsday didn't have a high power level. He'd never learnt how to utilise key. Raditz assumed Doomsday to be an easy touch, so he rushed in for the attack, went straight for the kill, but before he knew it, he had a fist straight through his heart. Raditz was killed in one shot by Doomsday. Absolutely aghast, Vegeta demanded that Nappa 
fight this fiend. Nappa stated that he was in a different league to his fellow Saiyan Raditz and attacked full on. He fared much better than Raditz, he didn't quite get killed in one shot, but within a couple of minutes he had his back broken and was tossed to the floor right in front of Vegeta. Vegeta, furious that Nappa had embarrassed him, launched Nappa up into the air and proclaimed, what good are you to me if you cannot fight? None. Vegeta wiped Nappa from the face of the earth. Vegeta faced Doomsday ready for combat, but just at that moment the sky went dark. Over on Master Roshi's island, Superman had summoned the eternal dragon, Shenron, and wished for Goku's life to be restored. Goku's life was restored, and in that instant, Goku appeared right in front of Superman, using instant transmission to get from the other realm. Goku put his hand on Superman's shoulder and used instant transmission right onto the battlefield. Superman, only expecting to encounter the Saiyans, was surprised to find that Doomsday was also on the battlefield. Doomsday went crazy, he went berserk and attacked Superman. Superman powered up. Vegeta's power scouter started to rise. It was clocking Superman's power level. What? It's over 8,000? Vegeta now understood how Raditz was defeated. But of course, Vegeta knew his own power level, which was 18,000, far surpassed the Kryptonians. But he didn't quite understand the Kryptonian biology when near a yellow star. However, his power scouter picked up a new power level. Goku was now powering up as well. What? It's over 9,000! However, Goku's power continued to rise and he would ultimately have a power level of 12,000, much stronger than his main continuity counterpart. Vegeta understood that Goku, who still had his tail in this story, was the Saiyan that Raditz initially came to Earth to look for. Vegeta being impressed that a low-class warrior could achieve such a power level asked Goku to come with him and fight against the evil Emperor who destroyed their home planet, Planet Vegeta, the home of the Saiyans. But before he knew it, Goku had launched an attack. Goku and Vegeta engaged in a battle. Vegeta had the advantage due to his superior power level, but Goku was remaining in the fight due to his mastery over the Kryptonian martial arts, Torkazam Vo and Torkazam Rao. But mid-fight, Goku noticed something alarming. He noticed that Kal-El's power level was dropping rapidly. Superman was getting beat to a pulp by Doomsday. He told Vegeta that he would go with him if Vegeta helped them against Doomsday. Vegeta, who believed he was superior over this version of Goku, agreed to do so because he simply wanted to fight Doomsday himself and test out Doomsday's abilities. Goku attacked Doomsday but got swatted aside. Then Vegeta, the prince of all Saiyans, attacked Doomsday as well. Vegeta had some success at first, but once again, Doomsday just seemed to be growing stronger every time he got hit. He seemed to be becoming more invulnerable with every attack landed on him. Superman yelled out that Doomsday couldn't be beaten, but Vegeta was having none of that. Vegeta loaded up a Gallic gun and hit Doomsday with it with a direct hit, but all it managed to do was push Doomsday back. Doomsday seemed to have almost no damage from this Gallic gun. Vegeta, in absolute shock, cried, what kind of monster are you? Both Goku and Superman attacked at once and even Vegeta joined in in a three on one assault. And once again, they were knocking Doomsday around, but it just wasn't having any effect. They were tiring out, getting weaker, but Doomsday just seemed to be getting stronger and didn't seem to be tiring out at all. That's when Goku had to come up with a plan B. He told Superman to fly as high up in the sky as possible and told him when the time was right to launch his new attack. Superman, completely beaten up at this point, didn't know why he had to do this, but he looked at Goku in the eyes and nodded his head and did so. Goku screamed, Kaioken times four! Blitzed himself in close to Doomsday, tagged Doomsday, used the instant transmission high up in the sky to where Superman was, sent a key blast into Doomsday's stomach and sent him upwards into orbit. This was when Superman knew what to do. Doomsday couldn't fly. So Superman charged up the Kamehameha, and sent it directly towards Doomsday, sending him further into orbit. However, it seemed like Doomsday was starting to absorb the power of the Kamehameha, but at that moment, you hear Vegeta scream, Gallic Gun! And a double Kamehameha Gallic Gun attack sent Doomsday deep into deep space. They all landed back on the surface of the Earth, all utterly exhausted, but at that moment, Goku let his guard down. And that's when Vegeta blindsided Goku and ripped off Goku's tail. 
Then he launched to Powerball up into the sky and transformed into an Uzaru. He grabbed Goku and Superman, both exhausted, and started to crush the life out of them. He told Goku why he ripped his tail off so that he wouldn't transform into an Uzaru as well and stated that Goku having the Kaioken technique would mean trouble for him later down the road so he decided to kill him. Enjoying the torment, Vegeta continued that he was about to use Uzaro against Doomsday but Goku came up with that plan B and now it's worked all in Vegeta's favour. However, there was another fighter nearby monitoring the fight and he heard this and he sent a Destructo disc and cut off Uzaru Vegeta's tail, transforming Vegeta back down to his base. This mystery fighter, of course, was Krillin. Vegeta called in his space pod, climbed in, and said this won't be the last you see of me. Superman and Goku had not just seen off Doomsday, but they also saw off the Saiyan threat, at least for now. Okay guys, that's the end of part two. I hope you enjoyed it. A bit crazy, I know, but if you want to see part three, when Kalel and Kakel visit planet Namek in search for the Namekian Dragon Balls then please smash a like on the video make sure you're subscribed to the channel to be notified when that video drops until next time ad astra